you listening? Are you watching? You know what it is, not just boxing. From the canvas to the madness, sit down and get yourself locked in. Are you listening? Are you watching? You know what it is, not just boxing. From the canvas to the madness, sit down and get yourself locked in. I was chatting to Sam and Sean Noakes a few weeks ago, and it's like, at what point do you bite the bullet and turn pro? Because mm. even turning over, it's such a hard decision for fighters. Definitely, and I think that, that lends itself to having a really good team around you to navigate you the right way, uh, like managers, promoters, and even your coaches, like, right, this is what we need to do now. So that's the importance of having a good team around you, isn't it? Yeah. So I met you at Ollie's last fight. Yes. yes. And um, you had a great story, you, you can say it now, how yeah. you got into boxing anyway how you got this opportunity and quit your job and yeah yeah, yeah. It's, it's been a complete change of lifestyle for you yeah definitely so um i wanted to get into coaching i was coaching football for a long time but always loved boxing i didn't have the necessary experience that some might say like boxing amateur i didn't have any any fights or anything like that but i loved the sport and i love coaching so i thought let's let's give this a go um so i emailed loads of professional coaches like everyone you can name just no one got back to me so I was like, all right, look for amateur. I didn't even know where to look for amateur gyms. Um, but then my my mum come home. She works at Sellers Park Sainsbury's, and said that old oh, Bobby, who I used to work with when Bobby was a teenager, which is a few years now, like when he was a teenager, used to work at Sainsbury's with my mum. And she said, why don't you go down and see him in Brixton and go from there? So I came down. I think four days before my twenty fifth, twenty sixth birthday, took a Sunday session, and that was it from the off. Like I still remember Bobby's first ever session that he showed me with, with Viv and Joel, two amateurs he had at the time. And I just never left. Even when I moved to like Woolwich um, with a partner, I'd still travel in and do my one session a week uh, on a Sunday. And then I moved back up here um, and then was just working and doing p little PTs. And then COVID hit. And COVID was, was terrible, obviously, for a lot of people. But without it, it wouldn't have made me make that leap. Um, so. I came back and started PTs and Isaac was training here with, with Bobby at the time. And whenever Bobby's like, oh, can you grab this, grab that? I was like, yeah, no problem. Like, go and grab the stuff for him. Um, yeah, grabbing the stuff. I was working a night shift at the time as well. So I'd do my night shift, stacking shells, finish at seven, and then be just in the gym, like, wanting to help out, you know? So I'm, I'm reliable. Um, I was like, what made you so committed to this? Because my, my goal from a long time ago wasn't like people, how you measure happiness. It isn't about your own happiness. My happiness is making other people happy and making them be able to fulfill their potential and their purpose. Um, that's why I love coaching so much. Um, like to foster what that person has inside of them. They might not even realize it yet, but you have the, such a belief that they do. To find that and then for them to have confidence in themselves is like coaching 101 for me. Um, so yeah, Isaac was on his comeback to fight Dylan Prezovic on Channel 5. And whatever happened, happened. And um, so four days before Isaac was supposed to go to camp, he said to me like, oh right, you're coming with us, I want you to come with me. Purely because I was like reliable and, and whatever was asked of me I would do. And obviously loved the sport of boxing. Um, so I had a decision to make, it was like, right, quit the night shift job and do it. Or keep the night shift job and regret it. So I was speaking to people, mum, dad, and I was like, listen, I'm never going to get this opportunity again. And then from there, I got my foot in the door, work diligently, work hard now, and then can go from there. Because I, I really feel like the coaching side of it, like the ABCs of boxing, how to keep someone safe, is quite simple to teach. But it's how you are as a person to convey that. And I think that's the art of coaching and getting through to someone. So back to long, long point. I might not have the necessary boxing experience myself, a lot of people do, but they don't convey it in the right way. So being a good coach, uh, being a boxer doesn't make you a good coach. But being a good coach is something that's quite innate, I believe, anyway. And, and you can learn the rest. Um, Some but, of the best coaches in the world never even competed. Exactly, exactly. Like Angelo Dundee had Muhammad Ali and, and Sugar Ray Lennon. Um, so yeah, you, you can learn the rest. And it actually makes me work harder, knowing that I have that motivation of, you didn't do your boxing. Oh, well, you better brush up. 10 times harder than everybody else. That's why we work so hard, me and Bobby. That's why we analyze things. We look at everything. How can we make this the best? Because we leave no stone unturned because we feel like we can't afford to because we want to be the best for ourselves and our boxers. You know? 
Yeah. Do you, did you ever have that imposter syndrome when turning up to shows, knowing that you're fairly new to the game? Did you ever sort of feel a bit out of touch? Did that sort of force you as well? Because you hear a lot of people that make a, a transition, they, they usually use that as fuel. Yeah, definitely at the start. Definitely at the start. But then you, you kind of trick yourself into a fake it till you make it. And now I feel like I'm at a level now where I can proudly say this is what I do for a living. You know, if we go to a show, we're not sticking up like a, a sore thumb. We know what we're doing. But definitely at the start, you have that. Definitely at the start, you have that. Well, I saw your session that you coached there. Yeah, it was brilliant. Yeah, it was yeah. really good. Yeah, Thank there you. was things that I'm going to do when I get home. So, yeah, yeah, definitely. And in terms of like learning coaching, so the ins and outs of the fundamentals mm -hmm. and the things that you need to pass on, yeah. um, how long did that take for you to learn? Would you just ask questions as you're going or was you just constantly watching? No, so I... Um... I'd rather look like a fool for a little bit and find out the right answer, ask a question like, why'd you do it this way? Why'd you do it that way? Because a good coach, and that's why I'm so glad that, like, I work with Bobby, because I can ask Bobby, why do we do that? And he'll give me an explanation. Because you've got to be aware of coaches where it's like, why'd you do it? Oh, it's just the way we've always done it. But no, tell me why. Tell me why are we doing this drill? How is this going to help me in the ring? Oh, it's just, it's just what you do. No, but why? Why, why, why? So I pride myself on the fact that anything I do, if someone asks me, why'd you do that? I can break it down for them, point, this is why we're doing it, this is the evidence, and then analysis yeah, and why we're doing it. Have you found it quite difficult chopping and changing between coaching the amateurs to the pros? It's completely different, coaching the amateurs. It's got to be kind of one size fits all a little bit, just the nature of group coaching. But what I love is when they've got two, three, three weeks out for competition, taking them one-to-one, -one, you know what I mean? I feel like in the amateurs, all you can do is try and put in the fundamentals. As soon as you start teaching stuff that's, Alien it isn't going to work for everyone, you know? Yeah, and in terms of people that have their own styles as well that you've sort of had to sort of manoeuvre through and mm -hmm. like you've got someone like Ollie Edwards that's come forward, mm -hmm. ferocious, um, and then you've got, for example, uh, Blair, who's a nice, slick southpaw counterpuncher. Um, do you structure those sessions completely different every time or are there still a lot of things that you can...? Yeah, definitely. So, so the structure has to be quite rigid, but what you work within that structure is is free form and based upon that athlete. So I had, I had someone ask me before, like another gym was like, what, what style do you teach? And to me, that's such an alien question to ask a coach because a good coach knows how to teach defense, teach attack, teach counter attack, teach them how to move their feet, teach them how to fight on the inside and the outside. So a, a really good coach is able to coach many different athletes but I think structure is very important to have. But how you work within that structure, that's where you have that little bit of um, that's where you have that little bit of flexibility in what you coach. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And are you a big boxing fan? Yeah, massive, massive boxing fan. Again, to have that, I love the history. I'm a big like history nerd, so I like the history of boxing. There'll be times where I'll see something inspiring and think, Jesus, I've seen that person do that in that fight. That's how they counteracted it. You know what I mean? If it's Duran working on the inside or it's Hearns when he's going to Duran's body and then throws that right hand over the top and knocks him out. I'm like, I've seen that. Let's put it into structure, you know? No, that's so good. And when you're analysing fights, let's say Oli Edwards is coming up right now against an aggressive guy that's coming to win. What are you looking in that opponent's footage to infiltrate? Are you looking at his weaknesses, what he does wrong? Are yeah. you looking for bad habits? How do you study the tapes? My name is Dennis and my name is professional boxer for Frank Moore and MTK Global. This is fortress boxing. A lot more protection, it's a no-brainer. Around your, around your thumbs, around your knuckles, around your wrist, that's exactly where I have the problems at. They're very compact, so I feel like I'm punching hard with them on as well. And I feel like when you wear, when you got a spar on 14, 16 ounce gloves, the smaller wraps can't really, they're too small for the gloves, that makes sense. So these are a bit bigger and they're getting the gloves a bit more, they make them more compact. So we always look at what they do well, uh, what the opponent does well, but then what they do after the thing they do well. So let's say they, uh, they're aggressive and they throw quite well and they're happy doing that. How are they getting out of that situation? Do they throw the four punches and then freeze on the spot and give you time to throw back? Or do they throw the, throw, throw the four, step back, give a huff and a puff? Because if they do, let them do their work and then we're going to carry out as well. Um, but I mean, there's, there's two, a few schools of thought with that. Do you look at your opponent's weaknesses? Of course you do. But the importance is that's what they do poorly. This is what we do very well. And I think sometimes coaches get stuck off what your own boxer does well. 
So let's say the kid's got a good jab. Well, Ollie's got a better jab. Ollie used his jab first. So you don't want to get, again, you've got to be flexible in what you're looking at. You've got to look at what they do well, but then also don't get lost in the fact of what your boxer does well. You know, if, if it's a Ferrari against a truck, the truck might be able to go more often, but that Ferrari's quick. So just beat him straight off the line, you know? Mm -hmm. That makes a lot of sense. Do you ever have um, a clash of opinions with Bobby if you watch them together? Do you ever sometimes sort of bash heads and be like, well, actually... We, we, ne we never... we never, not, not, No, yeah, yeah, yeah. Not bash heads, but we'll have conversations of like, do you think this is the right technique? And, and of course, we'll talk. That's what's really good about our coach relationship. We're not like, oh, pussyfooting around. No, it's like, I think this might be better for our boxer. What do you think? What do you think? And then what we do a lot of the time, we ask for a third opinion from the boxer because we work with our boxers. They don't work for us. It has to be that sort of, right, you're on the inside now, Ollie. What are you going to throw? Well, instinct instinctively, I'm going to throw that. Brilliant. You throw that then. You know, so we have a freeway conversation. Me, Bobby, and the boxer ultimately because you don't want them getting in there thinking, oh, God, what was my coach telling me what to throw now? No, no, no. This is what you throw now. This is how we're going to make you safe and how you get out of that, you know? Yeah, definitely. And when you're handling a fighter's ego as well as trying to give them constructive criticism, mm. obviously they're always trying to elevate and up their game. How do you tell someone what they did was bad after a fight and how would you come across? Is everyone different? Can you be brutally honest with some people and other people you might obviously... Definitely. I think, I think that's the importance of sparring as well. Again, I've seen a lot of coaches where the boxer will spar and then they just disappear. Like after our spa, we always give feedback to our boxers, like a little bit of a shit sandwich. Like this is what you did very well. This is your area of improvement. This is what we want to look for in the next, in the next spa. Because um, I don't really think personally that shouting and berating someone gets the best out of them. I think you've got to nurture that, that, that human being and, and that person, especially a boxer. People are oh, like, I need people to shout at me. I, I don't like that. Mm -hmm. I don't like that. I think that falls on deaf ears, unfortunately. But if you're someone that raises their voice every now and then, it's a bit like, oh, Jesus, that's a shock to the system. Um, so to your point, how do we constructively give feedback? It's just through, through sparring and then going again. And again, showing like, listen, you need to do this better. If they were to come back and say, oh, why? Number one is because I said so. But number two, we can offer an explanation as to why, you know, as opposed to, right, get in there, throw your shots and then roll out. Why do I need to roll out? Well, because he's throwing a left hook. So you need to get out of the way, you know? That nah, makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And um, what have you got coming up then as a gym? So you've got quite a few. You've got Ollie next week, 6th yeah, of July. Yeah, so 6th of July, Ollie and Louis uh, boxing on the TM14 Nielsen Super Show at the O2. So that's, that's really fun to come up. That's really good. Um, that's the first time we'll ever have two boxes on the same card as well. So it's another box to be ticked off, which is really cool. We had a stadium fight before we had two boxes on the same card, which is mad. But yeah, it's the way it is, you know. Um, and then, yeah, we'll have pros out in the, in the se uh, third half, second half of the year as well. So looking forward to that, mate. Yeah. Great. And how do you motivate these fighters? Obviously in camp, it can be grueling. They're mm -hmm. in a calorie deficit. They're coming in that some of them are working part time mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. How are you coming across as a coach to still get the best out of them and motivate them and still, still give them that push because you can't, you can't be really nice all the time. Yeah. Number, number one is the environment that we foster, like. The boxers, we realise how we how hard we all work. You know what I mean? We don't have anyone in the gym that doesn't want to be there and work as hard as they possibly can. That's one of the benefits of me and Bobby being young coaches. Still, we're just as we're just as hungry. We never want to be more hungry than our athletes. That's number one. But we're always pushing them to motivate them to see how hard they want to work. Um, we we create an environment where people want to work hard. That has to be number one. You have to be there to work hard. Um, in terms of how to motivate individuals, remind them why they're doing it. People have different reasons why they're doing it. Remind them every day or when it gets tough, more so why they're doing it. Again, you can't go to that well too often. But like, remember when you're doing it because it falls on deaf ears. So be tempered in, in when we release that information to them and when we don't, pull them back. All right, we need to get into them a little bit. Remember you're doing this for your family, mate. Yeah, okay, let's go, let's go. So that's what we do. Just a good environment, mate. Yeah. Yeah. It's an absolute pleasure to have Gymfluencers on board as a sponsor for season five of the Not Just Boxing podcast. 
They've been supporting us since we were on 10,000 followers. If you have over 1,000 followers and you'd like to showcase your health and fitness journey, or if you're an up and coming boxer who likes making content, you can receive free products in return for just the story. You can also work on paid collabs where you set your own rates. They've worked with the likes of C4, Jimmy's Ice Coffee, and Skinny Food Co, and the list goes on. If you want to hit them up, use the code NJB to get started today. As a coach, what makes your perfect student? What, what are you looking for in someone to progress? There, there's obviously certain attributes that people have that, yeah. you, that you desire to coach. Number, number one, um, it'll probably be the same answer that Bobby give you, but the ability to be coachable, not just inside the, the gym, which a lot of people will do. A lot of people will be diligent in the gym and, and uh, be a boxer inside the ring, but then you also need to be a boxer and an athlete outside the ring. So when you've got someone that's coachable in and out the ring, that's number one, because if they're not there, if they're not receptive, it's not going to work. Um, number two, I think that, at least for me, we need to be able to get on with the boxer so we, we have really close relationships with all of our boxers, you know what I mean? It's not a gr massive team, but it's quite a big team. But we have that emotional connection to our boxer, and I think that's really important. I personally couldn't w work five days a week with someone that I didn't get on with or didn't like. That would just drain on me, you know? Um, and then also, thirdly, they've got to have some sort of um, dog in them. What I mean by that is that resilience. Uh, and personally, I feel that that resilience and that dog someone has inside of them it's either there or not. Now, some people have the outward dog where you can see it straight away, but then some people have that dog that you have to find inside of them. If you, if you don't have that, sorry, I, I don't think it's something that can be taught. I think you need that tenacity and you can have all those numbers that you want, but when you have the intangibles, mindset, mentality, the, the ability to go to a place you don't want to, but you have to, uh, is very important for me as well. Yeah, there's, there was a really good caption a boxer put up the other day. Uh, Ryan Rosicki. Oh, the cruiserweight. Yeah, yeah, yeah I'm yeah. pretty sure I'm going to get this wrong, but he said something on the lines of, I don't want to talk about footwork drills. I'm mm. here to take somebody's head off. Yeah. So he's like, I think 19 and 0 as a pro. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He doesn't want to be told the ins and outs of you know what he's doing. He just needs to be told what he's doing. Mm. And he's there with that ferocity as yeah. a fighter. And that mental side of a fighter is really what propels them. You know, you can have someone that's very skillful, but if they're not there to fight and if they can't dig deep, like yeah. you, you do see it often. Easier said than done. Definitely. It's easier said than done. But like you said, you've either got it or you haven't got it. But like but those those flashy boxers that we know, like they get to a level, but why do they fail? Why do they fail? Because they don't have that that grind of when it gets tough I've got to get going here it's never because they get outboxed they're, they're incredible talents and boxers but it's when they come up against someone who's like I don't give a shit what you do I'm going to be coming I'm going to be coming I'm on your chest all night long like it's, it's not a problem I'm going to be here so you've got to have that inside of you I think yeah and I love seeing that as a boxing fan even if they lose the fight if you see them box at their best and just put on a good show for example Anthony Joshua against Usyk in the rematch mm, mm. he lost but he boxed the best he's ever boxed. Yeah. And he put on a great show for someone that didn't have that amateur background like Usyk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so I, I just, I really admire that with fighters, how they have that dog in them and they still come back and you're coming off that loss. Yeah. People discredit him quickly. Oh, he's got a glass chin, this and that. People love him again now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, we've had a full 360 since the Andy Ruiz fight. Mm -hmm. It's been, what, four years? I don't know, five years. But... There's so many critics out there, but when you really look at Joshua's career and what he's done, it's incredible. And I think even when they lose, all of these fighters, even when they lose at that world level, yeah. you lost at the world level. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah, you're yeah, that 0.1%. Yeah. And um, I think boxing fans are starting to come around now. They're happy to see the 50-50 fights. Definitely. Definitely. That's, that's something they have to trade off. Is If, if, if people want to see 50-50 fights... The loser who loses can't just be shunned to the side. That's that's really not fair, because they are taking us 50-50s, like you said. Um, yeah, Joshua's Joshua's had an absolutely incredible career. He's probably an overachiever. Like the amount he's, the amount he's done in such a short space of time is unbelievable. And let's have it right, he's the biggest superstar in 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 boxing at the moment. You know, so he's he's class. He's a pure role model as well. You know, for people to look up to. Oh, and he also, he's brought back boxing in Britain. Yeah. 
he just being that main event, he has managed to get on the undercards of those Joe Cordina when he was coming up. Mm. He was on the AJ cards. When you start looking at who Joshua had on his undercards, yeah. they're all doing their own things now. I know Cordina's come off a loss, but mm. he's still a superstar. He's still having a good career and he's still going to come back strong. Yeah, his next fight will be for a world title or an interim, won't it? Something like that, yeah. Yeah, so it's it's really nice to see boxing fans are being fans, win or lose. I think I think a lot of that as well comes from the kind of MMA mindset now, UFC, where a loss isn't fatal, they can just come back again. But the importance bit there, especially with boxing, you have to be entertaining when you lose. Mm-hmm. You know, look at like Chisora. Like he's made an absolute career of his biggest fights, he's lost them, but he's a multi multi millionaire now because mm-hmm. he's entertaining. And I think that's what a lot. And of, he's still dangerous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Still poses a threat, but like. A lot, a lot of new boxers and, and coaches don't understand the importance of being like savvy with social media and stuff like that. If you take a loss, it's, it's not fatal anymore. But boxers need to understand that you need to build up your own regime, your own repertoire yourself, you know. And it's great to see because even like someone like Isaac in your stable, mm-hmm. you know, he's come short against some of the best guys and he's still got so many big fights to yeah. go. You know, people are happy to see him fight. He's still a big name. He's entertaining. His war with Chris Bill and Smith, fight yeah. of the year. Yeah. You know, so to have that, win or lose, it's it's great to see. Yeah, yeah, especially especially with Isaac, like with with the fights he's had, I said to him before, like, Isaac, you're giving like your pound of flesh to the people. Like Floyd had two areas, right? He had his pretty boy era and his money era. Mm-hmm. I was like, Oh, you deserve that money era now, you know? Go in there, win the fight, don't worry about them. You know, because you built out like, a cachet of like the Wadi Camacho fight, Luke Watkins fight, like unbelievable. Um, Chris Bidham Smith, like you said, fight of the year contender. But Isaac Chamberlain has that dog in him. And because he has that dog in him, he'll always be in entertaining fights. And that's why people like to watch him, you know. So yeah. Definitely. And it's good to have him in your stable because people look up to him and, mm-hmm. and everything else. It's good that you can see the levels. Yes. You know, that those levels in the gym to see where you can be at, that, to, to see it in person. Yeah. It's it's incredible. Season 5 of the Not Just Boxing podcast is proudly sponsored by My Meal Prep. My Meal Prep have made it easy for you to stick to your diet goals as well as eating delicious, tasty, homegrown food. Make sure to use the code NJB20 to get 20% off your first order today. Isaac's only recently turned 30, but he's, he seems like he's been around for a for a long time. I thought he was older. Yeah, 30 years old. So like Blair, now our elite amateur, he's older than when Isaac fought Norris Acoli and headlined the O2, which is absolutely like ridiculous, isn't it? Wow, yeah. Isaac's lives like, I said to him before, when you write your autobiography, it's gonna be unbelievable, because he's done so much so young, mm-hmm. and touch wood, we still got, we'll have great years ahead of us, you know? So him, having him in the gym is an inspiration, not just through how hard he works, but what he's been through, like he, he'll he happily speak to Louis or Ollie on the phone, you know what I mean? And be like, right, this is what you need to do at your, your point in your career. So that's really, really good having him in the gym. How is he out of the gym? Isaac? Yeah. Funny, man. Is like, he? As a human being? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, hilarious. Yeah. Hilarious. He's the funniest, like, the funniest guy I've ever met. He's ridiculous. <laughs> he's absolutely ridiculous, yeah. But he's really good. Like, he, he's there for his team. He looks after the people that look after him, you know. Really, really good geezer. Really, really good. And... Him as a dad, like, brilliant. Like, we'll bring Zion to the gym, we'll play about. Like, he's brilliant dad, absolutely incredible dad, yeah. Oh, it's great to hear. Yeah. People also forget that these athletes and some of these superstars, they mm-hmm. are also fathers. They're also, you know, regular people. And yeah. it's so easy now. People are on Instagram, Twitter, mm. whatever, X. Um, it's so easy for people to discredit all of these fighters and talk badly when they've never had gloves on in their life. Yeah, yeah. And, and they don't even know what it takes to, to go through a day of training, let alone a 12-week camp. Absolutely. Like, and I, I put myself in that bracket where it's like, I didn't have the experience, but I hold these boxers and the people that go in there and do what they do at such high regard. That's why I work as hard as I do. Yeah. It's like, God, like, they're going in there, putting themselves online. Why wouldn't I do this for them? You know what I mean? Why wouldn't I watch an extra hour of tape? Why wouldn't I go and get stuff that they need, you know? But um, what was your question? Sorry, I lost my train. I was Sorry. just talking. There was no yeah. question. Yeah, yeah, we were just chatting. Um, but yeah, honestly, every behind every great boxer is a great team. Yeah, yeah. And there's so many little pieces to the puzzle that mm-hmm. get them there. So as you said, in your gym, you've got a good gym atmosphere. You've got you and Bobby. You've got, you know, you've got 
elite amateur. You've got novice amateurs, elite. Yeah. You've, you've got every single level here. And you're a fairly new club as well, mm -hmm. which... Obviously, I didn't know Bobby said, but they had only their first fight 2014 or yeah. around then. So it's a fairly new club with everything that's happened, and um, it's great to be a part of it. Yeah, it is. Like we couldn't say thanks enough. You know, Afiwi, Tony Goldring, and, and Stedman Scott. Uh, 2014, our first fight. We've already had multiple national champions. Um, my, myself, I've taken over the senior team as well. So we'll really kick on from the from the new season in September and get people out there because you know, we want to be winning across the board. We want to win everything, every every belt, we want to win everything. Brilliant. Yeah. Well, it's been great having you on. Thank you very much. And I'll see you on July 6th. Cheers. Yes, we'll be there.